Welcome to another CO2 Monday with Trevor. I'm your host, Trevor Matthews, and today I have a returning guest, Patrick Clarity from Dan Foss. Super excited about having this conversation um, about CO2 with Patrick. He has over 27 years experience in the industry. He's been learning and understanding CO2 for years, and I'm happy that you're joining me again, Patrick. How are you doing? Thank you. Glad to be here, Trevor. Great. Yes. Always great to be here. So me and Patrick were just talking about, uh, he was just at the uh, Gustav Lawrence event. Is that correct? That's it. Gustav Lawrence and yeah, in, yeah. in Norway. So he is, a, why don't you talk about just a little bit about him and because he's the pioneer really of the CO2 uh, revolution, right? For yeah, well, I don't know him personally. I'm, uh, luckily, I'm not that old yet. But uh, <laughs> no, he was, um, he was a Norwegian uh, scientist who, who basically started um, uh, natural refrigerants and, and mainly CO2 in, in Norway, which spread around the globe. And, and now we have a conference every, every two years um which is dedicated to him it bears his name so um yeah. and it's just three days of of technical papers being presented so uh, awesome it's extremely interesting uh, and very tiring after three days yeah i bet yeah i bet what's one thing in that conference because it's three days of thing what's one thing that you took away on on it you have uh, one thing yeah the, the 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 main thing that we we, we, I took away uh, basically the whole conference is about natural refrigerant and it's it's extremely clear that this is the future in any which way or form right yeah. so we, we still got ammonia which is a great uh, refrigerant yeah but mainly for the the, the very big capacities right um, and then we got co2 coming in and it's coming in everywhere in in yeah. small systems big system medium-sized systems it's it's you cannot think it away basically. Yeah. So it is the future for sure. Yeah. And I, I totally agree with that. That's why I'm doing these things and having expert guests like yourself on here to talk about CO2, because I know that is going to be the mainstream refrigerant uh, for commercial refrigeration. And it's, I see it more in chillers, heat pumps, you know, cause supermarket was the main one. And you guys, Dan Foss, yeah. like a pioneer for the equipment. Cause you guys were one of the original manufacturers of making CO2 components. Uh, which we'll I guess we're bit. I guess we're somewhat somewhat lucky that this this whole CO2 revival, because in the end it is a revival. It's not new, yeah. right? But um, um, when it started again, it started uh, basically in in the colder countries like like we had in Scandinavia. Um, I, I'm from the Netherlands, but quite close to there. And even the the Danish government they started raising the prices on chemical uh, HFC refrigerants really early on. So when we in the Netherlands, which is quite close, were still dealing with chemicals, they had raised the prices already in, in, in Denmark, for instance, that it was a lot cheaper to go for CO2 systems, right? So the government pushed it in, basically. Yeah, and and, and that's the, what we've seen even here in Canada. Uh, like it came into uh, one of our problems in Quebec, and that's really where CO2 started many decades ago. And then the the government really, I believe, they were do, funding projects and helping push um, OEMs and and contractors and end users to go towards uh, CO2 because that's where our main hub in Canada it all started. And now you can see it just spreading out throughout North America, which is super exciting. And uh, when I did work at uh, Emerson, I did all, a lot of CO2 conversations and t talks and trainings. We uh, used to talk a lot about the F-gas regulation because that's really where regulation started for, for me seeing anyway. And it wasn't really yeah. here in North America. It was that F-gas regulation started in the early mid-2000s and then uh, 2014, I think maybe there was a change. But then uh, we had a, a chart that we shown and it's just like you were talking about. It was like HFC tax hfc bans hfc you know um or credit co2 credits or whatever it is you know what i mean it was it was very interesting to see how the regulations started to move that and, and really help end users to make decisions and oems i guess make decisions yeah, sure. on natural for sure. and, and for for these uh, manufacturers is getting more and more difficult to to keep using the the chemical refrigerants and they're still there right and yeah. They're, they're coming up with, with new stuff, which has uh, uh, a lower than 150 um, global warming potential, which is, which is okay, which is the norm, right? 
Um, and then for a few years, uh, they can use it. But in the end, um, that will have problems as well. Yeah. So the, the future is definitely in, in naturals. Yeah, I love so. it. I love it. So let's get into it. Let's get in. Let's talk about some things. I know I'd like to get in right off the bat. Let's talk about some the differences of ejectors. I think because we had a real good question last time, and I think we should dive into that right off the bat to get a good explanation of the difference between um, a high pressure, I believe, ejector and a low pressure ejector. Is that correct, Patrick? Yeah, they, they both look uh, similar on the outside. They're, they're both really nice, shining, shiny valves. Um, they look like a big block of, of uh, um, <laughs> aluminum, right? But um, the, the insides are quite different, right? So we have uh, an LP ejector, which is called a low pressure ejector, and we have a high pressure ejector, the HP ejector. And again, they look similar, but they are designed for different types of systems. Um, because the geometry of the um, ejector, um, and I can I can share some slides. If, yeah, let's if, do it. If that's okay. Yeah, let's do uh, it. Let, let me see if I can get that up and running. Just let me know when you can see my screen here. Not yet. There now we I go. Yep. You should, Beautiful. Yeah, Beautiful. So I put some pictures together just to make it try and explain a little bit better. Um, can you see my screen? But yeah, this, no, this... perfectly. I can see it perfectly. Perfect. Super. So this is a picture of the, um, the low pressure ejector. And the, the geometry of the low pressure ejector is designed basically to take the full load for the median temp evaporators. So if mm. you if you at the completely at the bottom, you see the, the, the empty evaporators. If you if you follow the, the suction line here upwards and then to the left. So you have the blue line coming into this middle port into the into the ejector. And so this you cannot do in big systems because then the then the the, the load on the medium temp will simply be too big for the for the ejector to take fully. So okay. this is for systems somewhere, let's say from 40 to 100 kilowatts. So let's say a small supermarket, which yep. is which is doable. So when it's warmer outside, when there's a warmer ambient and the pressure on gas cooler side is quite high, that um, that's the, 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 the time when the ejector is doing the most, right? At low pressures, it's doing a lot less. The higher the pressure, the more it can basically suck in from this medium temp. So it is designed to take the full load. Um, that means that this empty compressor uh, or empty compressors are not running on the empty cases, right? The empty compressors are running solely on the liquid receiver. Mm. And that means that basically empty compressor becomes somewhat of a parallel compressor. So it can run at a higher pressure than normal. So when, when normally you would have the empty compressor running at let's say minus 10 in Celsius, and please convert that to Fahrenheit for yeah, me. No, that's Trevor. okay, 10 Celsius. <laughs> <laughs> um, now it can run a bit higher because it's only running on the liquid receiver alone. So that's the, that's the, the LP uh, ejector for you. So for somewhat smaller systems, and we call it an LP ejector because the pressure lift, and that's the difference in pressure between the suction pressure, the blue line here, and the receiver pressure, that's the yellow line. So that pressure difference is between three and seven bar normally. Yep. If we take the HP ejector. Well, let's just go back to that one. Just one, one more sure. uh, second. So for those people that are, don't get to see the, the screen, um, what Patrick is talking about is that there's a line going from the suction line up into the injector instead of just going right back to the, that medium temp. And when you talk about raising the suction pressure, this is what we're trying to do in all refrigeration. We're trying to always raise the suction pressure. You raise that, you reduce the compression ratio, you're saving energy. Yeah. You're doing- and, and, and that's the whole point between, uh, of all um, energy uh, optimizing systems that we have. Uh, in the end, the idea is to make the life of the empty compressors a little bit, light, a little bit lighter. Right, because yeah. those compressors, they have the hardest life, right? They have a, a relatively high suction pressure. They have a huge uh, discharge pressure. 
So the temperature, the pressure difference across that compressor is quite high. So as soon as you can make the life of that compressor a little bit easier, you're saving money. Yeah. So you can do that by either lowering the discharge pressure, which is not something easily done when you're doing uh, CO2 systems. So what you can do, you can do quite a lot on the suction pressure. And that is where the ejector comes in, basically. Awesome. I love that. So that's the LP ejector. Um, what about the HP ejector? Yeah, the H HP, again, it looks similar. Uh, the picture you see on the top left, the ejector is quite similar on the outside. It's just the geometry of the six cartridges that are inside, that is different. It's just designed differently to handle a different kind of system. And um, an HP ejector typically is used for systems between 100 and 300 kilowatts. So mm. this you cannot use on smaller systems. And I'll explain because this ejector is not designed to take the full load of the empty evaporators. It's only designed to take part of that load. Um, and you can see that. So you have the blue line, the suction line from the empty evaporators coming out, going up to the empty compressors and the ejector again. And basically the gas coming out of those evaporators, it's, it's split in half more or less. So part is going to the empty compressors, part is going to the ejector. and in the in the ejector, uh, it, the suction gas is mixed with the high pressure coming from the uh, gas cooler, going into the liquid receiver, and from there it's being sucked in to the parallel compressors. So the, and that's where the saving comes in. So you're taking away gas from the empty pack. That means the empty pack can be smaller than normal. Right, so if you in in an, in the Europe, it's quite normal to have three or four compressors there. Um, so that means that maybe you can have three smaller compressors, or maybe you can leave out one and only have two, because the load on that pack is smaller. Um, but of course, the gas that's going into the ejector, it's not disappearing; it's going somewhere. So it's going into the liquid receiver, and then again. From there, it's going into the IT, what we call, or parallel compressors. And that's where the main saving comes in because the parallel compressors, they're running at a higher suction pressure. They're running at the same pressure as in your liquid receiver, which is quite a bit higher than the empty compressors. And that's where the saving comes in because every, suction, every degree you raise the suction pressure, you're saving three to 4% on system performance. So if you can raise that by four, five, six degrees, you're saving quite a lot of money in the end. Yeah, and that's what it's all about. And this is a concept that I didn't get until I really worked at the compressor manufacturer and understand and looking at these performance charts of compressors where you raise that suction, you know, and you get a huge amount of saving. Less, it takes less power and you get more energy out of it. You get more capacity out of it. Uh, and... One thing to note, so with the high pressure ejectors, you will use this with parallel compression. Yeah, that's the whole point of the of the HP ejector. That is designed to work with a parallel compressor. And that's why you cannot use it on smaller systems because the, the capacity on that system is simply too small to have and empty compressors and parallel compressors. It just, you have too many compressors or too much, too much load there. So. HP yeah, so, ejectors only for bigger systems, 100 yeah. to 300 kilowatts. Yeah, so and that I uh, just convert that like 340,000 BTUs to almost a million BTUs system. So decent sized system for that. That sounds one. like a lot if you say a million. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, one, uh, one other thing that I want to point out there is that uh, why Danfoss came up with this design is because when you have just a standard basic booster system, a basic trance critical system, you are bypassing 40, 50% of the load. It's called flash gas. Yeah. You have, you're, you're bypassing that, and this is unusable energy. So it's not, you're not getting the energy from that. It's just wa really wasted energy. Now yeah. with this, now we're making it into usable energy, where instead of having 10 compressors at, say, 15 horsepower each, you might only need five compressors. Yeah, and that was the whole problem of getting CO2 into warmer climates. 
you were getting so much uh, bypass gas that it simply didn't make sense anymore to, to use a standard booster system. So you had to come up with some, some other stuff to try and save some energy and also be able to use CO2 systems in warmer climates. Because before, we, when we only had booster systems, um, it was very hard to sell a CO2 booster system in the south of Europe. If you went to south of France, you were in trouble, right? And then it was more efficient to use um, R404, for instance, yeah. energy-wise, at least. Yeah, and, and that's exactly the case. And this is what's great about technology. Um, you have scientists working at Danfoss to build something like that. That was, that was, it's an awesome technology. One question I have, is it something that you can add on to, or is that just one, like that HP, there's only one HP design, or is there multiple like high pressure multi-ejector design? Same with the LP. Is there like, uh, cause I see five solenoids or six solenoids on that. Are they all the same size? Yeah. No, they're not. There, there, there's a binary um, equation in there. So um, ejector number two is twice as big as ejector number one. Mm. And then number three, again, is twice as big as number two. So that's how you add up. So you have six solenoids and you have six ejector, uh, ejector cartridges below that, but they all have different uh, capacities. It's just that numbers four, five, and six, they're all the same. But the first, they, um, they scale up because when, um, when it's colder outside and we're not necessarily um, taking a lot of that empty suction gas, at that mo moment, the ejector just works as a high pressure valve because we're not sucking in so many suction gas. And then, of course, it just needs to be able to, to control the capacity, right? So that's, that's why we have the different sizes of ejector inside. Awesome. So with this setup, you do not need to have a high pressure valve then? That's going to work as the high pressure valve? Or is there any Correct. situations where you would need both? No. It, okay. in, in, this, in this setup, uh, you would only need uh, an ejector and you can use two of them in parallel. If you have bigger systems, you can use two of them in parallel and then you're just uh, switching in, in, in parallel. And then you can do up to, let's say, five, 600 kilowatts with two ejectors. Oh, next wow. to each other yeah and then and then so with this one though you would still need that flash gas bypass valve the ccmt in that system yeah, th that one stays because as soon as you're starting up the system when you're just starting um there's not enough capacity to to run the parallel compressors so when the the, the system is just starting up you're operating the liquid receiver the pressure in the liquid receiver with the flash gas the bypass valve and as soon as that has a certain opening degree for a certain amount of time, that's when you switch over to the parallel compressor. And as soon as that compressor is running, we basically close the gas bypass valve by raising the set point for, uh, for that valve. Awesome. And all this is controlled from the, um, the 782, is that correct? Is this all controlled by one controller? Do you have multiple controllers for this? We have several controllers that can run um, CO2 systems, um, but uh, the AKPC782A, it's, it's a long word, but that's, that's how it is. AKPC stands for Adapt Cool Pack Controller, just for, for information. Um, and I, I have a picture here. Um, so if, if you look at the picture, this is a, a complete CO2 system, right? So you have... Um, the LT compressors on the bottom, the green ones, then you have the, the MT compressors on the top, the blue ones we have in yellow, uh, a parallel compressor. And on the right, that's where you have the full um, high pressure part. So we have a gas cooler all the way on the right. Of course, we have fans we need to control on that gas cooler as well. We have, after the gas cooler, we have either a high pressure valve or an ejector. You could have both, but that's, it's, it's, that's quite seldom. Then we have the, um, the receiver and of course the flash gas valve. So all of that is controlled out of one controller. Wow. Yeah, and and that's that, a... that used to be several, but uh, yeah, time, time goes on. Um, and, and we're doing also some, some smart stuff here and there. So now it's, uh, it's all in the, in the controller itself. Yeah, yeah, because it makes a big difference when you have a full integrated system compared to having multiple controllers. 
Because when they're not talking to each other, it can make it uh, definitely more difficult. Uh, and you can have smoother systems when everything's talking together. And I've seen that many, many times. One of the things, though, what happens if you run into an issue with, because I see you got an AKSM850. I'm, I'm guessing that's the full management controller. And then you have like some case controllers, the five, uh, 550As. If Correct. one of those controllers fails, do you lose everything? What, what type of controllers are this? Would you lose everything if the 680 stopped working or they, do they work independent of each other as well? Everything works uh, independent. So we have the, the picture you have on the top, that's the, the Adaptive Cool System Manager, the AKSM. Um, that one basically um, functions as, as a, a supervisory control. So it, it, this is the unit that talks to, talks, communicates with all controllers and gathers all alarms and does some, some, some smart stuff in the system. But in the end, the controllers are running independently. So the PEC controller is running on pressures and when the suction pressure goes up, compressors ramp up. That's basically how it is. Um, on the case side uh, or the evaporators, when, when the room temperature goes up, the valve opens, that will make in the end, the, the, the suction pressure goes up, go up and the PEC controller um, starts ramping up. So let's say this system manager um, for some reason crashes in the end, it's all electronics. Everything can happen, right? Yep. Um, but then the system will go on. Um, awesome. You might not have remote control. You might not be able to to dial in from remote, but the system will keep on running. Yeah, and that, and, that, and that's key because you could have a, a power or brownout out of the system, and then all of a sudden that controller doesn't start up. But if everything else starts up and gets running, then 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 that's that's great. So we dove into ejectors. We do dove into the high, pre um, high pressure and low pressure ejector. Let's talk a little bit about the high pressure valves. I know we jumped ahead real quick, but what's the importance of the high pressure valves? And I've seen changes even with Danfoss. The very first one was really bulky, the one that I seen. It was like a big square, like a um, uh, yeah, rectangle, tall one. That I think they were, I yeah. can't remember the name, I am... It's the called the ICMTS. I, I am yeah. and, and that's the valve. And it had an actuator on top called the ICAT. Okay. And th that's the part that you mean, the rectangular part. That's basically the motor that was on top of the valve. And that was more or less an industrial size valve, right? And that was the only thing we had in the beginning. Um, uh, before we had the CCMT, we, we, we had the ICMTS, which was doing a good job no problem at all because in the end it was controlled by the same controller um the valve is just a means to an end right it's just a valve that opens and closes based on a signal it's it's getting but it was simply too big and for for the smaller systems it, it didn't make sense to have such a big valve on top so that's why we came with the the ccmt um we started out with smaller sizes and we still use the icmts for the bigger systems and then we also came with uh, a bit bigger uh, CCMT valves, which had the, the pressure transducer also uh, mounted on the, on the valve itself. And basically from that moment on, we didn't need this, this big bulky ICMTS anymore, but it's still there and we still use it for, for even bigger systems when, when needed. So um, yeah, it, it, it has been gone through quite uh, an evolution, the valves that we had. We, we started out with maybe one or two, and now we have a whole portfolio. And now we, we, even we have the CCMT Lite, which is a valve that, that came to light one or two years ago, which is an, an even smaller one, uh, an awesome. even smaller step of valve. Yeah, so all the ones, I guess, besides the light, I think, are also field replaceable. So if you run into an issue, you can take them apart. Is that correct? Some of them. Yeah, so the, 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 C, the CCMT, uh, the bigger one, you can take apart. The smaller ones, you cannot. Okay. Uh, so, and yeah, the, uh, of course, you can complain about that. Uh, you, you, people always like to take stuff apart, right? And, and see if, if it doesn't work, it must be the valve, right? It must be, we need to open it up and there must be something inside. So some of them you can open up, uh, but the smaller ones, um, you cannot. So, yeah. Uh, 
And, that, and that's fair. So one thing that I had, I had a friend working on a system a few weeks ago, and they said they got the, the system uh, from the OEM, and the internals weren't inside the Danfoss valve. I know it's nothing to do with you. Do you guys, I haven't read the manual yet, and it's been a while. Do you guys recommend taking them apart when you're uh, welding them in or brazing them in? Not for the CCMTs, the, um, the ICM, ICMTS that we just mentioned, and I'm guessing that was the valve that, that you just uh, meant, because that's quite easy to take apart. Hmm. Uh, that has um, a, a, a bottom, a house, basically. It has an, a, an insert that you can easily take out by removing four bolts. Um, and that is stainless steel, which need to be welded, right? So I guess there, people normally tend to take it apart before they, before they weld it. The CCMT, it can be welded or braced. And mostly it is, it is braced with a copper pipe you can, you can put inside. Um, and, and people don't tend to take that one apart. And mm -hmm. you cannot really only take out the insides because if you take out the motor, you take the insides with it. Um, and the ICMTS, it has a cone inside that you can take out and still mount the top part. So it looks okay, but then the inside is not there. So I'm, I'm guessing it was an ICMTS without knowing the story. Of course. Yeah, no, no, and that's good. It's just, it's all these learning things as a, as a technician in the field that things happen like that. And you just got to be aware that, okay, how do I resolve and fix the problem and go move forward? Um, let's get into some of the, the electronic valves that you have. So you have, we have the high pressure valve we just talked about a little bit. We got the flash gas bypass valve that you talked about. We talked about the ejectors. What do you have for like the cases? You know, I, I see on there, you got an AKVH10. Uh, what yeah. type of valves are they? Yeah, this is a somewhat older picture. I should have corrected this, but we, we have since, I guess, 30 years we have what we call the Adapt Cool Valve, the AKV. And um, I'm guessing that is a, quite a well-known um, name in, in, in the industry because it can, uh, there are even competitor brands with competitor um, controls that are using our valves, right? So this is quite a known, quite a well-known valve. Um, it is a, what we call a PWM valve, pulse with modulating valve. So it, it, it opens all the time uh, and closes just like a solenoid valve does, but then it has an, uh, an orifice to, to start the expansion. And um, we used to have the AKV since about 30 years, I guess. And it has been there for um, more or less 10 years without much change. Then CO2 came in um, and we needed to have an AKV for higher pressures because the, the, the standard AKV didn't, didn't work. Uh, on, on those kind of pressures. So we came up with the AKV H, H standing for high, high pressure. Um, and that worked uh, for relatively small capacities because um, we lost the, the biggest orifice. Um, so we, it, we, it could only work for, let's say supermarket evaporators and, and somewhat smaller evaporators. So bigger evaporators, we had an issue and there you would still need to use the, the CCM or CCMT stepper valves, which have higher capacities. And now since, since a few years, the old AKV and the AKV-H are both phased out and replaced by the AKV-P. And that one, that is the new valve that we will have. And it looks exactly the same as the old AKV and AKV-H, but the AKV-P, that's the valve that we will have for a long, long time still. Uh, controlling uh, the evaporators, and and we're also stepping up the capacity. So since it uh, since it came out, we added two capacity steps. So now we are up to orifice eight, um, which for MT um, applications goes up to more or less forty kilowatts on on one valve. Wow! So we are stepping up that that capacity. Um, so who knows? So when you say that it has different orifices, is this something you can change in the field or is it you buy the valve and it has that specific orifice and if it fails, you got to buy a whole new valve or whatever. If you don't, you select the wrong one, for an example, just say you select one that's too small. Is, can you change a cartridge or a cage inside or do you got to change the whole valve? No, you, you, can, you can exchange the inside. So basically what you, you select a valve during, uh, with cool selector, which we'll show a bit later on. 
you select the valve, you buy the valve, you get the valve with the orifice that you selected. So let's say an AKV uh, 10.6, for instance, with orifice six. Um, and if you did your, your selection uh, in the right way, it'll work. If for some reason the application or pressures, they're different than, than you um, imagined, or you simply bought the wrong code number, which, which also happens, of course, then you can open it up and exchange the orifice. It's, it's just a little nut basically with a hole inside that you can relatively easily uh, screw out and put in a new one. So awesome. th that's a spare part, that orifice. Yeah, and that makes a big difference, right? And the big thing about these valves, and I've trained and worked on and many different electronic valves and mostly with the Emerson one, but it's the same when I talked with uh, Corel or Sporlin or all the other manufacturers as well. As technicians, as refrigeration professionals, we need to do our job to keep the system clean. We need to put filter dryers before the valve so they don't get plugged up because I've seen so many valves, not the manufacturer's issue, not the manufacturer's problems. It's the system related issues due to poor installations or not uh, brazing using nitrogen and inert gas. It's so important to do that. What I do like about that I'm noticing with CO2, people are starting to do their jobs or installations more the way they're supposed to do it. They're doing, they're taking their time, they're doing it right, they're you know following the guidelines that have been there for 50 or 60 years, <laughs> like mm -hmm. not that long, but there is a process to do it. Proper evacuation using nitrogen, because I know it, nitrogen wasn't always used, but with PoE, you need that. And you got to yep. keep the system clean, especially with electronics in the system. You got yeah, and especially with CO two because it's it's a little bit more dirt sensitive than than the older chemical systems. And we do advise to to use a, a filter uh, before every expansion valve. Um, is it always done? Probably not. And and in the end, that's that's up to the installer. But at least that's our advice, and that's what we put into the manuals, right? Yeah. But uh, yeah. In the do end, it's up to the installer. Yeah, do you have any in certain valves? Do you have screens inside them that they need to be cleaned or anything? Any we do other? have some, yeah. Okay. In, in some valves, we do have an, an insert uh, filter, and it's a really small uh, mesh uh, filter. And also in the AKVs that we just mentioned, um, they do have filters inside. Um, so they can stop most dirt um but they're not very fine we we have one that's that's quite fine in the akv ps because the akv valve it comes in two different uh um forms let's say but there yes there is a filter inside but still we recommend to put one um, in front of the valve as well 100 percent. 100 you should be using filter dryers that's what they're there to clean the system <laughs> make sure to yeah, protect sure. these valves these uh uh, very important components in the system. Why don't we get into cool selector? It's something I'm still learning on. I know that you know lots about it, and I love I love this program. If you don't have cool selector two yet, I highly recommend download it. They got the best enthalpy diagrams out there. I love training using enthalpy diagrams or pH diagrams, whatever you want to call them. There's lots of different names people use, but this is a selector that has all of Dan Foss's stuff, all the the manuals, installation guides, um, products, and it's easy to select components. And yeah, and so you have it up there. So if you don't have Cool Selector 2, I highly recommend download it. Yeah, I just pulled it up and, and Cool Selector, if, if, if you Google it, um, you can Google on Cool Selector 2 or CS2 Denfoss, you'll, you'll find it. If not, shoot me a message and uh, we'll, uh, we'll send you a link. And Cool Selector is the main um, selection software that we have. Uh, in, in the past, we did have several pieces of software, and now we're trying to put them all into the, to the Cool Selector program. So this one is getting uh, bigger and bigger, and it's, it's a real life living and breathing beast. Um, so it's basically every time you, you start up, um, you get a message that there's a new, um, a new update more or mm -hmm. less every week or every two weeks. So uh, make sure you keep, um, you stay updated. So when, when you start up the, the system, um, you're, you're looking at the page that I'm looking at now. And this is the, the main page and it's called uh, valves and line components. And this is where you can select 
um, more or less single components, right? Here, here you do not select um, any any lines, uh, liquid or or suction lines that you can put in front of the valve. You can do that, but then you have to select the the tab on the left called components in series, because then you can select a valve and you can put a piece of pipe in front of it. You can um, give this piece of pipe a certain uh, diameter. You can give it a pressure drop. So you can see how the valve reacts to that pressure drop in that, in that pipe. Um, I tend to normally only select um, single pieces. So looking at this uh, page here, then on the middle part, that's where you can find quite a few um, CO2 components. So on the top, we have electronic expansion valve. So that's where you can find the AKV that we mentioned. And of course, the CCM and CCM2, CCMT that were mentioned earlier, you can also use as an injection valve for evaporator. So that's not only for a high pressure valve, but also for evaporators. Um, a little bit lower, you can find your transcritical uh, high pressure valves. You can find your transcritical gas bypass valve, and you can find the ejectors. And let's just um, go in and let's let's go into the gas bypass valve just as um, as an example. So on the top middle here, that's where you have to put in your system um, settings basically. So you have to set your capacity, capacity for the LT and capacity for the MT. So let's just take, well, let's say somewhat of a, a standard supermarket. So we will put in 50 kilowatts for the LT part. We will put in 150 kilowatts for the MT part. And then we have to set your suction pressure. So let's keep the suction pressure for the LT at minus 30. This is already set. And we keep the suction pressure for the MT at minus 10, which is basically your, your standard settings. Not optimized, of course, but it'll, it'll do for, for um, uh, a selection. Um, and let's select the valve on the top left, uh, on the left here. So we can select between CCM, CCMT Lite, um, CCMT. It's the good old ICMTS that you mentioned earlier, um, Trevor, and we have the old ICM. So let's just go for the CCMT. And immediately you will get a result based on the settings that you, uh, that you put in. So you can see a chart, you can see a, a graph, and you can see that where you put your capacity, so 50 kilowatts LT, 150 MT, this valve that's now selected as uh, a preference basically, so that's the CCMT 30, um, this is selected by the, by the system. And you can see if you hover over your mouse in this graph, it can do the capacity that was put in with around 80% valve opening, um, which is quite, quite decent. What you always have to be very aware of, because this is not a foolproof selection, right? This is not just buy this code number and you're done. Um, it wasn't, I hope it was that easy, but still you have to do some thinking because how do we select this valve? Are we selecting this valve in summertime? Are we selecting this valve in wintertime? And if you look closely, which is hard to see for any podcast users here, um, but on the, on the top um, middle here, we have a, a setting called max outlet temperature. And that's the outlet temperature of the gas cooler. And this is set at 35 degrees Celsius, meaning summertime, at least that's high summertime here in Europe. Um, if I pull that one down, so if I say now I have 15 degrees outside, what happens to the valve? Suddenly it's only, it's doing exactly the same capacity at around 30 degrees valve opening. Um, so this is still okay because these stepper valves, they can go down to about 10%. So it, it, even if it was 10% valve opening, it would still be able to do the job, but it is something to keep tabs on, to, to, to check, right? Always check all conditions, not only one condition, because if I were to select a valve in winter time and it has 80 degrees opening percentage, opening degree, um, the valve will not do during summer because then it will be way too small. So always check 
two, um, at least two applications. I got a question for you. Have you ever seen, or is there any applications where you had to put two uh, flash gas bypass valves in parallel because the system's so big? Yeah, and 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 that's not even so um, so seldom anymore these days because in in the beginning it was quite unusual, um, but now that CO two is expanding left and right, meaning sm to smaller systems and to bigger systems, it is coming quite quite normal. And the controller that we mentioned earlier, that the PC7A2A, it can control two gas bypass valves in parallel. And you can even have, that, have those two valves controlled really in parallel. So they open and close exactly in, in the same way as it were one valve, but you can also control it one-on-one. -on -one. So only one valve opens. And then when that is fully open, number two starts opening. So there are two ways of controlling that. And in the beginning, that was unheard of, but these days it's it's quite normal. Yeah. Well, that's so impressive that you can do it both ways. That's you know that's advanced logic that you guys have built in there. And I bet you it's just a click of a parameter that you can switch that or a parameter or two where you can change either way. And that's nice that they have Correct. a feature of that. Yeah, yeah. It, it's um, the the software the the program that we use to to uh, program that controller. It's called Surface Tool. And you just go into the, the receiver part and there you set up your, your pressure, you set up what kind of valve you want to use to control this, this flash, ga uh, flash gas. And you, you, can, you set up if you want to use one valve or two valves in parallel. So it is rel relatively self-explaining, uh, but still you, you need to have some experience and you need to, uh, you need to learn. For sure, you need to read the manual multiple times when you're dealing oh, yeah. with a big controller like this. Uh, that service tool, so that's a that is a a program for your computer to connect to the 782. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah, that is a, a small program you run on your laptop um, and you use during commissionings to set up um, these big controllers. Yeah, yeah. and so is that you, something you have, a, you have a cable connected between the valve? Sorry, the controller and the computer. Yeah. Yeah, and is that something you they people would purchase from uh, Dan Foss, or is it a program? How do you get the program? If somebody needs it. We have a we have a download page, and I can send you the link um, afterwards where you can download all software um, pertaining to these uh, these uh, electronic systems. Um, because this is not the only program we have. We have quite a, a few software uh, programs and it, it's free of charge. So awesome. you can simply download it there. And, uh, but still um, make sure you, you do some training or, or get some experience or do a table test before you connect to it on a live site and start playing with it. Yeah, and, and that's very important. We, we need to, as refrigeration professionals, we need to take the time to read these manuals, understand them. I know there's times when you're in a rush and you need to get a job done and there's end users and people and managers on your back to get stuff done, you want to do it right the first time. It might take you a little Absolutely. longer, but you do it right the first time, you're not spending an extra three or four weeks there afterwards or a month trying to figure out what is wrong because it happens. So do it right the first yeah. time, take the time to invest in yourself and read these manuals. For sure, for sure, and 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 use the tools that you have. Uh, use the, the the surface tool to program. Use Cool Selector to to do the the selection of your of your um, components. And and you can even use Cool Selector these days to to have a look at the the controllers that you need. And and oh. if I may, because in in this this start page that we see here on Cool Selector, there is a tab called Electronic Controls. And that will give you some hint of what controller you need. Because when you, when you click on this tab, electronic controls, you have different tabs under that for case controllers, spec controllers, system managers, they're quite um, some controllers. And again, this will, give, this will guide you basically to the right controller, um, but get some, get some guidance, or if you have no idea what you're doing, get some help. Uh, Call, call anybody from Denfoss or your, your maybe your wholesaler. For instance, if I click on, on the tab pack controller here, there are some selections on the left that will help you um, come to the right controller because now I can see around eight different controllers. And when I have no knowledge, I have no idea which one to select. So if I, on the left, I select CO2 system, then immediately 
some controllers disappeared and only the controllers that can run a CO2 system are left um, on the screen. If I then select, um, for instance, a modular controller, again, one, uh, one goes out. If I select parallel compressors, for instance, another one goes out. So you can gradually grind down to the right controller that you want to you wanna select. And if there are only two left, call somebody from Denfoss or your local uh, supplier and that they were able to, to help you with the last, the last part. Well, it's pretty straightforward. It says, you know, you get two LT compressors or four LT compressors, you know, or larger eight MT and IT compressors compared to three. So they're more relays and compounds, but yes, it's good that you have support like that to help um, contractors, technician refrigeration professionals out there with this stuff. So yeah, if you click is, on one... is, this is one of the latest features. So like I said, it's a, it's a living, breathing program. So it's getting nicer every time you open it. So if you click on one and just click on the A, uh, 782A, and uh, where would I find the documents up in the, in the top yeah, corner? It's so... on the, if, if you select it uh, on the top right, it says yeah. uh, documents and visuals. And I can, I can get some, if I click, click on this, I can find some, some data sheets. I can find a user guide. Yeah. Be warned, yeah. this is 130 pages. Um, I can find some uh, some photos, drawings. So there's mm -hmm. quite a lot of information. And even when selecting a valve like I did er earlier, um, if I go back to the gas bypass valve, um, where, where we have this, this graph here, I, I have a top, uh, a tab here called performance details. And even there I can click on the log pH diagram. So it will show exactly the application wow. that I um, showed earlier with the pressures, with the uh, capacities in an h log p diagram. So now that's impressive. Now, th when you learn about CO2 refrigeration, the first step, if, if so, if you're new to CO2 refrigeration, is getting onto this here, learning about the BH diagram and yeah. understand looking at each where everything's going. Because you see from 11 to 13, that would be your low temp compressors. So to understand that, and then, you know, you get your up to the tops, your medium temp. So understanding this is going to really help you out. And you can make a, sim a simplified diagram too. This one here is a little bit more to it than a, just a standard booster system. But yeah, when you look at this and you have someone explain it to you, and I got some videos on YouTube that you can look at, they're pretty straightforward, but this is where you want to start if you're new to CO2, because when you get that in your head, when you understand, okay, I'm above the critical point, you know, I'm in super critical mode, transcritical, there's no pressure temperature relation. But when we drop that pressure down over the high pressure valve, that uh, Danfoss valve, then you get that back down into that subcritical zone and then you got flash gas bypass going to the right and then you got that going to the left and so on and so forth. But understanding that is the key to understanding CO2. Absolutely. For me anyway. and, and if you're new to CO2, make sure you can read um, a diagram like this that you understand where the lines are going. And, and I understand if you're coming from a chemical refrigerant, this diagram will look alien to you the first time. Um, but study it, make sure that you understand where all the lines are going, where are my compressors, where is my gas cooler, where is my valve, um, where is my receiver. If you understand that and you come to a CO2 system the first time, you have a little bit better grasp of, of how it all works. Right? Yeah, and, and that's why I love this program because I, I use it all the time. And just because the, the it just shows you, like even that diagram right there, it's showing you the enthalpy diagram, and then it's showing you actually the hardware, where it is in the system going from point one to point two and so on and so forth. So taking the time to understand the stuff is just going to really help you, you know, invest yeah, that and, time and learning. And that's the, that's the whole issue with CO2 booster systems. It's all connected, right? In, in, in older HFC systems, you had a separate, let's say, LT system, and you had a separate MT system. Nowadays, everything is connected, and that is easier sometimes to find to troubleshoot on the other hand when something changes on the right you'll be sure that something changes on the left as well because it's all interconnected and if one compressor has a problem on the lt that probably gives you problems on the mt as well um, 
and and that's where that's what I always try to stress. Make sure that you keep a picture on the full system. Never concentrate on just one uh, part of it. If you have a problem with a compressor or a valve, look through the whole system. Is there something else that might be causing this problem? Because the valve might be able to, might look okay to you. So it, be, it it the issue might be caused by something completely on the side on the other side of the system. And that's the, the downside, if you will, with booster systems. It's all interconnected. And that's um, quite lovely on, on the Surface Tool software. If you connect that to your PEC controller, it will give you a full system overview. You will see your LT compressors, MT compressors, IT compressors. You will see your gas cooler pressure, receiver pressure, all in one view. And that will give you a great overview. And you can see all capacities, valve openings in one view. And that is very easy to troubleshoot. A game changer when, when that happens. Right when I've seen then the first time working on CO2 and I could see every component working, not having gauges here, having gauges on the roof, having to walk up and down ladders and stuff. When I, you got it all in one place, it makes it so much easier for troubleshooting. And I've talked to so many technicians after they started working with CO2, they just love working on it because they have all, they have everything. They can look at everything and really get a grasp of what's happening in the system. Is fans banging on and banging off? You know, is the pressures up and down? And seeing it affect the valve percentages. Now, gotcha. where before, when you just had a standard metering device or TXV, you don't know if it's 50% open, 80% open, 10% open. And now you can see all that and it just can make, I can make way more sense. And it does take time to learn this. It oh, does yeah. take time. It doesn't happen overnight. But if you be patient and you learn step by step, you'll start to see more in a graph like this when you see all the pressures and temperatures. Correct. And in the end, don't be afraid because it's CO2 and don't be afraid because it's a high pressure. Because the very first time all of us walked up to any refrigeration system, that was quite alien as well. We had a very cold part. We had a very hot part. How the hell did it work? And now we all know. And that will, that will be the same with any CO2 system. You'll learn, and in the end, it's just as simple. And you probably won't understand why in the beginning you had problems understanding it. But get the basics down, right? Understand why CO2 is behaving under certain pressures and under certain temperatures. Make sure you understand the, the physics of it as well. Yeah. And, and that's what I like about it. What it's making, especially me, it's making me learn more of the design, the, the design side of refrigeration, where that was alien to me before as a refrigeration professional technician out in the field. Because I, I was just doing my day to day. And then, you know, back in the day, there was a lot of blame and blame an engineer or blame an architect. And now it's no, it's I need to understand this. OK, why did this happen? Why did they make that decision to do this? OK. Mm -hmm. well, that made sense at the time when they weren't there, but now they're not here and things changed. They added an extra 20 kilowatts or uh, 10 cases, whatever it is to the system. And as a refrigeration professional, a technician, you need to understand the engineering side. And this is what I like about CO2. It's making more people learn more about refrigeration. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And you'll, and you'll need to learn. Otherwise, you you have a problem. Yeah, yeah, I love it. There's yeah. a there's a, it just you gotta just do just do refrigeration. That's all it is. It's just doing refrigeration, not skipping any steps, doing it right, and, and figuring stuff out. And that's what CO two is making. It's making the industry better. I know it. I can see it in technicians after they work on CO two refrigeration for a little while. They are better technicians. Seen it. Absolutely, and and that's what I what I would like to stress because maybe in in some cases in in the U.S. where where CO2 is well somewhat behind um, uh, behind Europe, and that is now starting up. And and to be honest, I would have wished that the first CO2 systems that came up in in Europe, I didn't spend too much time on it because you didn't know what the future would hold, right? And in at that point, it was just another refrigerant yeah okay it had some higher pressures but hey who cares and now it's now it's the new the new thing and it will it'll it'll stay here so when you come up to a co2 system make sure you you spend the time and make sure you you try to understand what it is instead of dismissing it and thinking well up to the next job right uh, try to understand because it's it'll it's here to stay yeah i love it
Patrick, thank you so much. This was a great conversation. We'll have to have more of these because I just learned so much again today. Just these little tips and tricks making me better, making me, you know, I got lots of stuff now I can share with people that I talk with all the time about CO2 refrigeration. So thank you so much for doing this. Cool. Uh, we do have a couple questions I'm going to um, ask you um, from the audience. It's, can you overload the parallel compressor? And I think that's what the question is. Can you overload the satellite? But I'm pretty sure it's, can you overload the parallel compressor? Um, I don't know what, what it's meant exactly by, by overload, but at some point um, it will run up to its capacity, right? And, and as soon as the parallel compressor is running 100%, and of course, when the system is designed correctly, because you can also have two or three parallel compressors. It doesn't have to be one. Most of the drawings, you only see one because it's not that common to have more, but you can have two or three. So in essence, it's not possible that you overload it because you have designed that system. But let's say that parallel compressor is running 100% and um, still, uh, it's not enough, right? Because the, the, the liquid receiver pressure is still going up and you need to have the, the parallel compressor ramp up even more, but it cannot. That means that the liquid pressure, receiver pressure will go up. And in the end, that means that your flash bypass valve will start to open also, basically to help that parallel compressor along. Um, by that time, your receiver pressure is a bit too high. It's at a, at a level where you probably don't want it, but your system will keep on running because the, the, the bypass valve will open as well. Yeah. So no yeah, worries I love, there. I love that. I love that because that's exactly right. If it's not sized correctly, you're going to run into some issues. But if it's sized, even if it's not sized, that, that, that's what the valve is for, the bypass. It's just you're not going to have the energy savings when you have that. The more you have that flash gas bypass valve open, it's the less energy savings because now your medium temp compressors are taking that gas. Um, I got another question here, and I'm not sure. With new transcritical, um, I'm guessing refrigerant in new RTUs, do you see any systems that uh, rooftop units with CO2 in it yet? I guess that's oh, the yeah. question. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, that, and that's, that's coming as well because the... The rooftop units, um, we tend to call that condensing units, but I guess that's, that's more or less the same thing. Um, that is becoming more and more CO2 as well. The, the condensing unit market is an extremely growing market, growing by about 20 to 30% a year. Um, and now also CO2 is coming, uh, coming into that market. And it is um, somewhat small still, because the, these units tend to be in CO2 tend to be a little bit more expensive than your typical HFCs because you need more components, you need bigger pipes, you or, or at least different materials. Um, but um, those units are becoming CO2 as well. We see that more and more, and that's also something that we're very interested in and and making components for. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Another question just came in. Uh, can you explain the triple point and the critical point? So this is the low pressure and the high pressure of CO2. Um, probably hard to do in, in two minutes that we yeah. have left, but um, the, the triple point, and I urge you to, to have a look at one of the Danfoss videos where we have a container being charged with liquid and then uh, they change the pressure and temperatures. I can, I'll, I'll sh send it Trevor to me and I'll put it in about the, this. Yeah, and I'll put it yeah. in the description. That'll explain it really well. But the problem is the triple point is at around four bar. Um, and if you if you have vacuumed your, your system and you start charging with liquid, you cannot do this below that triple point because then your liquid will turn into dry ice. So that means that you, first have to charge your system up to at least five, six, seven bars with gas before you start um, uh, charging with liquid. And that's just the nasty part of CO2, right? It's, it's not so bad, just have to take, uh, take it into account. And the, the transcritical part, that's on the high side. That is around, I believe it's 78 bars and 31 degrees. Um, when you reach that point, when you go across that point, that's when, when CO2 does not behave like, let's say, a normal refrigerant anymore. When you're below that point, you still have hot gas coming from your compressors, 
going into, into the gas cooler and coming out as a liquid. Just It behaves just like you know from any chemical. If you go into transcritical mode, you're not condensing anymore. So you're basically start with a gas and end with a gas. And that is probably a whole different topic as well. We can yeah. spend hours on this one. Yeah, I know. I love and, it. I um, love it. So, is there, we, so have, it... we have some trainings, by the way. I'll, I'll, I'll shoot you a link, uh, yeah. Trevor. Um, yes, and please, and please um, find me on, on LinkedIn because I have that link on my LinkedIn. And we have quite some uh, trainings that you can follow where this is explained as well. Yeah, awesome. So yeah, the triple point in um, is 61 PSI or 74 PSI A. And then the transcritical one is, I think it's 1,055 PSI or 87.8 degrees Fahrenheit. Patrick, thank you so much. Uh, if people want to get a hold of you, LinkedIn's the best, the best way. Oh, yeah. I got quite an uncommon name. So Patrick Clardy is quite easy to find. Just uh, look for Dan Foss and, uh, and a red T-shirt and you'll be able to find me quite well. Please, please reach out to me, connect to me and ask any questions you want and I'll come back to you. Awesome, Patrick. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for hanging out with us for an hour and I'll see you at the next CO2 Monday with Trevor. Thanks.